Tim very kindly agreed to resurrect the Polyac Center. It's always been here, but to become its director um, earlier this year. And it was founded at the journalism school in uh, 1983 with a gift from Saul Polyak, who graduated from the J School's class of 1926. Yes, we did have a class in 1926. And his wife, uh, Janice. And uh, they, they essentially endowed the center with uh, uh, a mandate that it illuminate the First Amendment as a cornerstone of freedom and, and liberty in the United States. And uh, they felt that democratic societies, not just in the United States, but around the world, would be well served by a center here at the J School that explored uh, those issues. And as I say, the center has been here. The uh, endowment has been very well used to advance our teaching and thinking about First Amendment press issues. Um, but I have to say, in, until this year, in a more traditional way, focusing on press law, journalists at risk, uh, pre-publication review, uh, First Amendment litigation and related issues. And uh, when, when Tim agreed to revive the center and start to convene um, discussions like this, uh, he suggested, as I, as I had very much hoped, that we think much more broadly about uh, First Amendment and, and uh, related subjects. And tonight's discussion is uh, really uh, an example of what we were intending to do. Um, I'll leave it to, to Tim and, and this extraordinary uh, pair of uh, colleagues to uh, flesh out the question on the screen, but I just want to thank them for their time and their contributions. And then finally, just for those of you who don't know Tim, he's a member of the law school faculty here at Columbia. Uh, he was a prominent candidate for lieutenant governor, uh, parenthetically, last fall here in the state of New York. Uh, and almost surprised and shocked, well he did surprise and shock some people even finishing uh, second, but he's also very well known for his work on um, media industries, antitrust enforcement, copyright law and free speech, especially in digital spaces. His book, The Master Switch, which came out in 2010, is really a remarkable narrative. I commend it to certainly all the J School students here, and uh, he's written uh, many other books and articles and is well known for his uh, authorship of the term net neutrality. So uh, thank you, Tim, and uh, uh, the panel, and I'll turn it over to you. Look, look forward to listening. Thank you again, Stephen. Thanks for uh, uh, committing the journalism school to trying to sort of explore uh, frontiers of um, areas like the, the First Amendment, which is what we're doing today. We're trying a somewhat ambitious effort to have a dialogue that crosses many fields, uh, law, philosophy, science, uh, in a way relevant to the journalist's favorite part of the Constitution, which is, of course, the First Amendment. Um, and uh, as I said, it's uh, somewhat experimental, ambitious, but we are lucky to have with us two uh, really wonderful and, and uh, deep thinkers, uh, f uh, foremost in their uh, fields, and I'll introduce them, uh, both of them, Nita to, to my left, Nita Farhani, is a professor at Duke who's come up uh, very generously, and uh, is both in the law school and in the philosophy department. And uh, she is a leading scholar in some of the ethical and uh, legal implications of the biosciences and serves on President Obama's uh, Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. Uh, Mike uh, is, of course, here from Columbia and is a neuroscientist, neurologist here at Columbia. has been studying a neurobiology of decision making for 20 years. And uh, he is the recipient of many uh, impressive awards, including the Golden Brain Award, which I hadn't heard of, but uh, is. It, uh, among them, and has uh, been elected a, a member of the Institute of uh, Medicine. And so, uh, and he's also the author of more publications that I could possibly uh, count, <laughs> and uh, is a testament to how uh, scientists publish differently than uh, law professors. Um, anyway, I thought I'd start it with a question, Renita, a very basic question, which is to say the First Amendment, uh, obviously part of the Constitution, uh, is often thought to enshrine and uh, protect the basic conception of freedom of thought. And I thought maybe you could just lead us off by giving us a basic sense of how philosophers have understood that idea and how you think about uh, freedom of thought. Sure, so I'm, I'm gonna take it a, a little bit differently, which is how uh, law has traditionally thought of freedom of speech uh, in the First Amendment, which is to, uh, for the most part, ignore that the precursor to speech, of course, is freedom of thought. Um, and we haven't really had to explore and flesh out the issue of freedom of thought because 
um, it hasn't really been endangered too much, at least in this country, since uh, speech is protected, and that is the manifestation of thought. As emerging technologies, particularly neuroscience, start to enable us to explore what's happening in the brain, potentially change what's happening in the brain, I think it raises some really interesting questions about whether or not there is such a thing as freedom of thought, and if really the First Amendment is designed to protect that thing, freedom of thought. Um, you know, I uh, focus a lot on uh, John Stuart Mill's discussion of freedom of thought in his book on liberty, which I think is a really wonderful discussion about how important the protection of freedom of thought is in a democratic uh, society, that unless we are able to have free exchange of ideas, unless we're able to have uncensored ability to think freely, uh, the ability to have free speech is meaningless. So that's the area in which I'm focused on from a philosophical and a legal perspective is um, how are emerging technologies starting to require and process to think much more deeply about freedom of thought. Yes, well, thanks. That's, uh, and that is, I, I'll agree with that uh, sentiment that as someone who studies First Amendment myself, even though freedom of thought is meant to be uh, underneath it, it's sort of been assumed to come with the idea that you can, the, with freedom of speech and you know, speaking thought can, can be different. Um, Michael, I realize I forgot to say your last name when I <laughs> introduced you, which is Michael uh, Shadlin, if I'm not uh, mistaken, so I apologize for that. Uh, let me start, uh, you're a, a, an expert on the, decision, the neurology of decision making, and um, I would say it's fairly obvious that the conception of freedom of thought has a natural relationship to uh, decision making. And um, let, why don't you walk us uh, through or, or talk about, given the current state of neuroscience and your research, just what you think is happening when uh, any of us, average person, um, sits in a restaurant and tries to decide what to order. I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm one of these people who can spend a lot of time trying to, to think about what to order. What, what is going on in, in our heads uh, when we make those kind of decisions? Okay, well, um, I should say that I study the neurobiology of decision making as a window on higher brain function in general. It's uh, most of what makes us be who we are, the decisions that we make, or as Saramago said, it's, uh, we don't so much make decisions, but decisions make us. And we sit in the restaurant ordering, choosing among N items on a, on a list, our brains are basically doing what your brains are doing right now. They're taking information from the world, from memory, um, weighing it um, appropriately or perhaps not with uh, emotional factors, social factors, and ultimately uh, integrating that information into a kind of a unit and, and then uh, pulling a trigger effectively and saying enough is enough, I have my answer. And basically that scheme, that simple strategy, we see it playing over and over again in our brains, whether we're making a simple decision about where to look left or right, um, whether, to, um, whether or not we think that uh, this is a person we've seen before or not, and, um, and, and of course um, things like um, uh, choosing partners and choosing to do right and wrong. Right. And, uh, and where the freedom part might come in, you might say, is that when we make a choice, we are also choosing among the possible set of things to consider. That is itself a decision. And in there uh, lies what I would view as a, a basis of creativity, of exploration, and, uh, and therefore, uh, to some extent, uh, the constraint or, or, the, uh, or the lack thereof on our freedom of thought. Right. So can I follow up on that? I think th what you've just stated is something I think that... Uh, economists and also lawyers understand to be very important, which you might describe as the fact that decisions, um, the decision as to what is in the set of uh, options is often more important or as important as the decision itself. An economist would call that the option set. And do you think, is there a difference between the basic process, as you see it, the process of decision and then somehow arriving, as you just described, at what the options are we choose between, or are they, are they the same uh, processes? Well, uh, the options available to us, um, some given, and right. some that we um, discover or invent, there's the creativity part, um, that, that constrains the decision space that, we, that, we, that we're working in. You know, I mean, if, if, if D is not on the table, and all is A, B, and C, well then we can't really consider D. Right. Okay, so, um, um, but, um, but at the same time, we, um, in the end, I view th the decision process as one that, that incorporates all of those elements. What's to be decided, 
what are the possible and relevant sources of information, how to weigh different pieces of information against each other, and ultimately, what's enough information to say, I have my answer. Right. Well, and I guess I'm, I'm, I'll push it again. You know how some, I'll just take that menu example again. I think it's not uncommon that um, most people will look at a menu, just to have an example. There'll be maybe 16, you know, five on it. But, you know, immediately they turn it into like three. You know, and then they're sort of weighing between those, those three. Uh, do you have some sense, is that, is that do you think part of the decisional process? Do you have a, a different way of describing that? And, and, then this, and then the other thing that I think is really interesting is some, sometimes you'll see people just seem to sit there with a menu. I don't know if any of you have this experience, to sit there forever and try and decide. And we were talking about how that's actually hard to understand that very process of just sitting there paralyzed, you know, for, for 10 minutes weighing two or three options out of, of 10. Sure. Well, there's part of what, once, from a neurobiological point of view, there's a cost to the effort that goes into making a decision. And so, I mean, it's not just that it costs ATP or, you know, energy in the brain. It's that there's some sort of psychological cost. We Maybe we value our time so we don't want to spend forever and therefore narrow down a list of 16 or whatever the number was to three. Uh, of course, in the back of our minds, we allow for the possibility of coming back to the remaining 13. And, um, and dealing with that. And so the, the, um, the, these basic processes, the way I see it as a, as a neuroscientist, is that these basic processes are the things that, yes, we can think about them in terms of um, choosing among menu items, but they're the very things that keep us sort of in the game, interested in the current task, the thing we were talking about now, but also in the back of our minds, considering other possibilities as well. That's the, uh -huh. the, the 13 remaining items when you're sitting, sitting there focused on the three. And I think we were talking earlier, you say, let's go back to the idea of the person sit there thinking forever about two options, uh, you know, back and forth. And you're saying that's actually not very well understood exactly what's going on it, it, uh, when we were talking last week. When someone just stays forever, they can't seem to make up their, their mind and suddenly the process slows down. I think, uh, what's going on in that situation? Well, um, uh, we don't know. As you right. said, we don't, we really don't. There's a, there's, there's a lot of things we do understand about decision making. And um, I think it's important that we do because it's giving us insight into cognition in general. But of course, there's a lot of the nitty gritty that we don't understand, and that's a great example, Tim, of right. what we don't understand. Uh, one of the things that, um, that, um, that, uh, that we think goes on when we're sitting there somewhat paralyzed, or at least taking forever to make what seems like a simple decision, is that you say, well, where do we go for the evidence that we use to make our decisions? Do we go to the newspaper? Not necessarily, in, you know, but when we're sitting there paralyzed, what we think goes on in the brain is a hunting kind of expedition, a foraging, if you will, for not for food or not for uh, information per se, but for scenarios. Uh, so psychologists call this prospective reasoning, thinking about casting yourself into the future think by recalling memory from the past. And I think that's the kind of thing that's going on in the brain. And if we, I guess we'll get to reading brains a little bit later, but if we could read brains, we okay. would see that uh, memory operations were probably at play. Right. Well, let me go to this uh, reading brain theory. So I'm going to pose a hypothetical question um, about whether we, basically about what freedom is. And I want to imagine two different uh, individuals. Uh, individual one uh, is a Columbia undergraduate who we imagine is sort of a state of utopia, as Columbia undergraduates perhaps are, roaming around the campus thinking of all the options. There's many cafes, as many of you know on uh, courses to take. They have sort of a, a state of uh, absolute fr freedom. I'm sort of exaggerating it somewhat. At least we, we describe it. Uh, and then the other individual is in solitary confinement and um, uh, basically uh, cannot leave their cell. Uh, and maybe it's dark. And the question is, if we were able to examine the brains of these uh, two people, one of whom we sort of, in our classic sense, said is very free, the other we would describe as uh, not being free at all. Do you think we would be able to detect any difference in, in th their minds, their brains, the kind of activity that is going on? I thought I'd ask with you first, Nita. So um, I I'll, I'll answer in part in the science, even though that's not my forte, which is to say um, that there have been some studies that have been done to look at people in solitary confinement versus people who are not in solitary confinement, the majority of us, right? Um, and the people who are in solitary confinement start to have atrophy in gray matter in the brain. They start to have a decrease in brain activation more generally. Um, now, how exactly that implicates their ability to make choices and what a robust sense of freedom would be, 
uh, is unclear, other than to say, obviously, sensory deprivation is going to constrain the kinds of choices we can make. But much more simplistically, there's been a lot of research that, that um, you know, kind of the, the, the popular version of it is, is that willpower is used up, right? And so if you can constrain your own choices, um, that will limit your decisional set and make it easier for you to make choices. So uh, if you put parental controls on your TV so that you can only watch TV for an hour a day, you don't have to make the choice each day about whether or not to watch TV because that choice you've already made at some earlier point and it constrains your set of choices. So I think um, the idea that your brain can be constrained either through an action choice you make or through a societal choice that other people make through solitary confinement obviously is going to affect your decision making. When you are free to make choices, when you are free to contemplate the world, when you're free to contemplate any sort of action choice you might make, um, the way your brain is going to be activated and look is going to look fundamentally different. Now, how does that connect up with freedom of thought? How does that connect up with a kind of robust sense of what it means to be free? That's kind of, that's my question. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think that's a slightly kind of a, a different question, which is, uh, you know, d do we need to have our choices utterly unconstrained in society in order to have freedom of thought? Um, and I think the answer is a little bit yes and no, in that I, I don't think it's appropriate societally to limit what we have access to. I don't think it's appropriate to limit, for example, we'll get to a demonstration a little bit uh, later from now, access to information about yourself. If you could hack into your genetic information, should you have access to it? I think the answer is yes. If you could hack into your brain and see what's happening in there, should you have access to it? Yes. Can we nudge you? in a particular direction as a societal choice to try to make choices that we think are more favorable for society without constraining your choices, or would that impact your freedom of thought too much? I think that would be appropriate. I think it can, we can nudge people and that that would fit with a broader kind of political framework of what we think is the appropriate balance between government, societal choices, and individual choices. Um, but we, you know, I think there's a lot for us to unpack there, which is right. how free do we need to be? How much access to information do we need to have? How much access to ourselves do we need to have in order to truly have whatever this concept of freedom of thought is that might underlie the First Amendment and underlie freedom of speech? Right. Now, Michael, you were saying earlier that, uh, uh, that as it regards the, sol the prisoner in solitary confinement and the Columbia undergraduate, um, that in some ways the their mental processes biologically would still be similar. Yeah, the, I mean, it just it, there's a tension between trying to understand how the brain works in uh, um, step by step. How is the information acquired? How is it assembled? How is it brought together, weighed, and ultimately lead to a, a discrete choice between A, B, or C items or the menu items? That that how probably plays out similarly in animals and in children. On the other hand, I, uh, as Nita points out, and I completely agree with this, the, the way we think about the world, and if you think about that, what I said the psychologists call perspective thinking, that involves effectively um, interrogating the world with a kind of a, a creative idea about what might happen if. Now, if the set of possibilities is so heavily constrained, and solitary confinement is just an extreme example, not having art in schools is a less extreme example, but it has the same flavor, then uh, the space of possible interrogation, and therefore the kinds of decisions we could make, or that we can make, or even the way in which we go about making those decisions will be limited because we can't appeal to an aesthetic sense or a knowledge of music or have a mastery of having practiced at some point at age eight or something as we approach another problem. So I think in that sense, the neurobiology gives us insight into how, in this case we're talking about societal factors, but how societal factors affect uh, the psychology of decision making. And we can try to knit all those levels together. Can I, can I just pop in for a minute, which is, yeah. um, you know, so I, I think the idea, and if we, if we tie it back to try to figure out um, what can we as a society expect in terms of our freedom, and what would be inappropriate limitations on is to ask questions about how much constraint can happen from a normative perspective, meaning what, what can society limit our access to without trampling on our freedom of thought. So to take 
the example of there's a company called 23andMe, which many of you may be familiar with. It's a company that does direct-to-consumer genetic testing. Um, and uh, what you used to be able to do is order a $99 kit from them. They would send out a little kit that you would spit into. Um, and you would send it back to them. And a few weeks later, you would go onto their website and they would give you a wealth of information that would tell you what your genetic, what your raw genetic differences were at different points in your genome and how that correlates to different health predispositions or trait dispositions from simple stuff like, are you likely to have wet or dry earwax to more controversial things like, do you have a particular genetic factor which increases your likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease or breast cancer? And the Food and Drug Administration shut down the operation in many respects because um, they felt like the information that was being provided to consumers hadn't been validated, which is a a legitimate concern, let's make sure it's good information, but they also had a different paternalistic concern, which is people would make bad choices when given access to information about themselves. In particular, they were afraid that women would go out and have double mastectomies that were unnecessary because they knew that they had a risk of breast cancer. And that kind of paternalistic choice, which is to say information should be filtered through a physician because you as an individual consumer can't uh, educate yourself well enough to understand the information is a constraint on our freedom of thought, what we can think, what we can choose. And so it ties back into limiting your set of choices that you have. The same type of thing is happening with um, FDA consideration of neurobiological tools that uh, measure different brain states uh, that are much cruder right now than the direct-to-consumer genetic testing information, but tells you things about your sleep patterns or your drowsiness or your alertness or your meditation, could tell you if you're likely to have an epileptic attack or go into insulin shock, things like that. And so I think the kind of intersection of these things is this interesting question of certainly, you know, the, at the extreme, solitary confinement is going to constrain your choices. But in the middle, limiting free flow of information in society can also constrain your choices in very interesting ways. And when is that when has that gone too far? When does that actually infringe on fundamental liberties um, and a liberty of freedom of thought that we should have? All right, so that's interesting. I mean, uh, turning to the law a little bit, the classic definition of what freedom of thought or, or freedom of speech would mean uh, would be much more in the lines of, well, you can't throw someone in prison for, uh, for, for thinking about anarchism or socialism, for example. And what you're saying, and both of you are sort of saying, is, well, actually, the capacity for freedom of thought is very dependent on, our, on the environment you're in and in a very uh, sort of inf and the amount of information you're able to get access to. So it, it suggests, not to be too legal, some, some I don't know, but a, a, a relationship between uh, the availability or access to information, as in your example, and, uh, and some of the First Amendment uh, freedoms, which I don't think is something the First Amendment has had a strong uh, view on, just to get uh, legal for a second. Um, so, Michael, I was fascinated by you, what you were just saying about, uh, uh, you know, the presence or absence of art in, uh, in, a, in a school. And I, and, and I guess your mediation on the, the external environment versus, uh, uh, you know, the internal process. And maybe you could elaborate on what you meant by that, um, that, that idea. Well, I, I think I'm just really repeating what Nita just, what right. Nita just said, that there are constraints on our thinking, but if we think about, it, the, at the level of thinking about how the brain makes decisions, even in an impoverished environment, we, the brain works roughly the same way. Right. Of course, the data that it has available, and even the exploration space that it would use to reason, create, um, think outside the box, we might say, um, of course, uh, is uh, very limited if you're stuck inside that solitary confinement box. Okay, right. so, and, um, and, and I, but all I'm trying to say is that th that's, right. uh, that's a much, we don't really have to go to the extremes to see those constraints on our thought processes, our decision making, um, and uh, whether we want to view those as um, limitations of our freedom, that's in right. some sense I feel like I'm beginning to, um, you know, uh, uh, transcend or you know, transgress, cross boundaries uh, of, uh, of expertise since I'm not uh, right. legally trained. Yeah. Yes, well, not only lawyers can talk about freedom, unfortunately, we've tried to make it that way, but we're <laughs> uh, 
just to um, continue along this, does the, but does the mind or does the brain biologically always, uh, you've sort of said roughly it will be the same, are there situations in which you really could see a big, a big difference? An example, I, I was, uh, we were talking earlier about research that Cass Sunstein has highlighted, uh, where people who um, uh, either are, are um, uh, starving or people who um, are in terrible fear for their security, their physical security, they think they're going to be killed or something like that. That's all they can think about. So they're meant, you know, they're, and I don't know how they get these results, maybe by surveys, but that's all they, they keep thinking, thinking like, how do I get food or how do I get, and that sounds different than the brain of someone, at least the ideal undergraduate who's sitting there thinking about, you, you know, um, Shakespeare's sonnets or the meaning of life or something like that, just to sort of, or, or are you saying still that's biologically the same process? Well, I would argue that, in, in, you know, we can put percentages on this, but, you know, 99% answer is that the biologically they're the same processes. Right. But that's because the same processes in a mouse and a dog and a monkey and a human. And, and, and so, and, and the same process when we're reasoning about what word to say next and we're re when we are reasoning about where to go for the food. And so the, the issue is what drives our, our, the interrogations that we make, the, the explorations that we engage in when we're trying to solve a more open-ended problem, not, not the menu problem anymore, but right. you ask me a question and I want to think through various options and decide among them about what I'm going to actually think about next, what book I'm going to read next. Right. To, to sort it out. And of course then, the, um, if we're consumed by getting food or escaping um, a violence, um, then uh, you know, obviously those things take uh, priority and we have less of a creative space to consider our, uh, in uh, making our decisions, that is to consider our options. Can I, can I press on that for just yeah, a moment? Sure. Which is, um, <laughs> uh, let's take the psychopath, right? So, um, so some research suggests that individuals are described as uh, a psychopath, a person who fits a set of criteria uh, that, um, that suggests that they're more likely to engage in risk-seeking behavior, that they are more likely to be criminal offenders, uh, that they may have brain differences. And one difference that's um, hypothesized, or at least there's some brain scanning data to suggest and support, is that they may have decreased activation in um, the amygdala in the brain, which is believed to be involved in emotional uh, decision making or a kind of a moral conscience. If we, if we were to seed it somewhere in the brain, it might be in the amygdala, right, crudely speaking. So would you think that the process by which they would engage in decision making is exactly the same as the process by which, I'm going to hope you don't have a decreased area of activation in the amygdala, as you would make, um, assuming you're not a psychopath. I don't know you well enough yet, but I'm assuming you're not. Um, Thank you very much. It's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> so assuming you're not, would you say that it's exactly the same understanding that your brain may be different in the way that they look? Uh, yes and yes. I mean, so the, the, the brain, uh, you know, the disorder, psychiatric disorders, you know, in, in a sense are all about relating structure to function, in this case abnormal function, dysfunction, and um, that's a great example. Um, but when we look at the psychopath making a decision, there is what we'd imagine, I, you know, I don't necessarily want to just attribute all this to the amygdala, but whatever, when, when the psychopath makes these dangerous, horrible decisions, they're probably engaging in the same kinds of basic biology, the same kind as of basic As me at the cafe ordering my espresso, espre uh, same as the menu again. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. very similar, but it just depends on what, how you want. They don't have the same input, right? They're not going to have the, um, the feedback, like if I see a person being hurt and suffering, I get feedback, which then leads me to make different decisions, but they're not going to get that feedback, exactly. right? Exactly. But so that's a little bit different of a decision making because the the, the uh, what's happening in their brain looks different because they're not getting the same kind of neural feedback that I would get from seeing a person suffer. Absolutely. So that's the second yes of the yes and yes. So the 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 basic biology will be similar, and then of course, if someone can't weigh empathic factors, they don't have a good social brain, or they don't um, experience or sense, um, you know, your boredom right now, perhaps, from my case, um, that, um, that they, they will not make decisions the same way as a person that uh, doesn't have that uh, capacity. So, so you know, well, we have capacity. Say the person in solitary confinement might be quite similar to the psychopath, right? Because when we've actually uh, put them in a period of sensory deprivation, or the middle case, which is the person who doesn't have um, art, 
uh, when they're growing up, and so they don't get a lot of aesthetic exposure and sensory exposures, music, art, whatever, you know, all of that that might actually develop those areas of their brain. Um, their decision making will look different, right? Yes, and it's a, and then the question will be: At what level are we going to understand that in, at the bio, in the biology versus in the psychology? You know, you know, did they get to go to a library? Is that is that the same kind of thing, or do they really have a problem with their cortex the way the psychopath has a problem with the amygdala? And I would again, I would say that 99% of the phenomenon of no, you know of normal people, not people that have a disease. Um, I don't know that psychopath. It's controversial whether it's psych psychopath is a uh, is an actual a disease entity or a psychological type. But in any case, of course, since the brain does everything at some level, I mean, the brain is responsible for our thoughts. I don't know. Maybe some people disagree with that. But but um, for, as a neuroscientist, that's that's you know that's the starting point of all reasoning. And so so of course, at some level, we can relate brain physical events, biological events in the brain with all the things we're talking about. Um, you know, in the case of the sol person in the solitary confinement that uh, might have a, a less functional cortex, you know, I've got to wonder, was this person, you know, beaten by the guards or something, and that's why they have less of a cortex where they just don't get to think about much. But the, um, it's, it's, um, and so, you know, atrophy. So uh, it's, 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 it, to me, Let's put it this way. If we go back to the psychopath, I don't see the style of thinking too differently from saying that the, someone who's blind also doesn't use visual information. The psychopath didn't use empathic but theory of mind information. Do you think that makes them less free in their decision making? That's a good question. Yeah, it's a great question. So it's, <laughs> I would say that it makes them less free in the sense that we're discussing it tonight, exactly, because there's a limited space of possibility. Yeah, yep. so I mean, it, it's interesting. interesting, the psychopath versus the person who doesn't get art exposure growing up, um, both of them have factors that are outside of their control in many senses, which are affecting their ability to make choices. Um, but this question of what is it, what's necessary to have freedom of thought, what are the necessary preconditions of freedom of thought, I would say they are just as free to make thoughts um, and to make action choices but you know the the questions that we might want to ask about how do we respond to the choices they're making might be different but um you know this kind of th this is the question that motivates right. me in this conversation is uh in what sense do we understand the necessary preconditions of freedom is it right. what society does is it the limitations of society the psychopath is born that way um and right. that's different than you know people who uh, end up with their choices constrained because of societal factors. Right. It is an interesting, I, I'll feel, I feel we've uh, gotten somewhere with this uh, theory at least, which seems sort of startling to me that a person who is blind in some sense is less free. I mean, it's a, I don't know quite where that takes us, but it's an interest possible, it uh, interests me. The other, the, one thing, I, I, what you keep coming back to, Michael, is this idea, and I, uh, that uh, in some sense the engine is the same. It all depends on the on the in, on, on the inputs, and I, I feel that um, it, it uh, rem this may be going far afield away but, uh, again. But it reminds me of the, the the sense that an economist would view decision making in the sense that they would say, well, um, uh, it all depends on uh, what what inputs are coming, what what incentives you're given. And uh, this may be asking you too much, but is, in some sense, are you saying that the uh, economists have got something uh, right when they're saying all that we do is respond to the, the incentives in our environment, or is that question too far afield? No, I think it's a great question, and it complements what Nita was just saying. I, th I think, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I'm saying that the limitation is only at the inputs, it, only right. at what we can sense. Those, these, that, that's come up in some examples, sensing the emotions of another or um, having an impoverished space of possibilities. But I think we really want to think about the, our, 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 our knowledge lives, our cognitive lives, is really more of an active interrogation, an interrogation of possibilities. And the limits of the possibilities affect um, our freedom of to be able to reason and uh, decide and just plain old think. And so in that sense, I'm, you know, I'm with you, Nita. I'm the, 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 
it's we we there there's a biology that allows us to explore mm -hmm. and there's a biology that allows us to gain information from the world and those are all part of the sort of the the palette if you will of of thought in general so um well how about that is there a difference in training that can make people more or less capable of exploring i mean maybe we flatter ourselves in universities that we teach people to sort of explore possibilities or you know is my exploration of uh, ex possibilities basically the same as uh, that a rodent looking for some cheese or something? Well, I, 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 let's go back to the econ economics question, yeah, sure. okay? Because I think it's a, it's a more fun one to, to, to play okay. with a bit, which is that the, 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 where the economists have it right is that the decision process among items might involve costs and projected costs and time costs and so on and so forth, fine. Where they get it wrong is that, is that the possibilities are like the menu. There are n possibilities and we just choose among them. Right. In fact, we worry about what are the kinds of things we might choose and even when there are n items, we w wonder about the kind of space we might explore to consider how much value we place on these items. And that's the kind of what I'm calling an active right. interrogation that is um, part of what establishes our freedom of thinking. To bring this back to economics, you're, sort, you're challenging their sense, if I have you correctly, their sense that you come to it with a series of preferences uh, that you already know what you, how you value these things. Are you exactly. challenging that conception? That you show up, you look at the end options and you value, um, like we're in a restaurant, you know, steak at 50 and you value chicken at 30 or something. So is that what you're challenging or challenging yes, something differently? Yes, that's what I'm challenging. The, 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 yeah, and, 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 you know, there's a field of so-called neuroeconomics or behavioral economics where this idea is being challenged right. all the time, that we do bring some psychology to the table and don't just think in terms of dollars and cents effectively and, and, and known values that we can look up and choose between A and B. Right. Shall we move to the uh, Fourth Amendment side of the well, <laughs> conversation? Sure. I mean, or do so you want to say one more? Thing well, here? I mean, so, so if, you, if you wanted to transition to a slightly different conversation where, where I think you want to go with this next, um, I, it, you know, we, we broadly agree on um, a lot of strokes and I think have established that uh, there are some necessary preconditions of freedom which involve the ability to um, have access to information and what the inputs are to have freedom of thought. Once you, if you start with the premise that there is such a thing as freedom of thought and there are some necessary preconditions about what types of information you need, you start to construct a kind of societal narrative, right? What is it that society can restrict? What is it that they can't restrict? Um, and then you start to ask the question of how broad uh, is freedom of thought and what does that actually include? Uh, and it gets you into some interesting conversations about what should you have access to and what can you do to your brain? So we're getting to the phase now where we can directly see a lot more of what's happening in the brain and we'll have a little illustration that Tim will show you that in just a second. Um, but you can also change what's happening there. So from the neurofeedback example will show you you could change your brain but you could also change your brain from a device I have here which is um, a direct to consumer transcranial direct current stimulator which gives you little shocks to the prefrontal cortex of your brain which supposedly increases your ability to do things like think quickly or supposedly might um, enable you to do things like learn faster or remember things better but there are also drugs out there that do that like Drugs like modafinil or, um, you know, if we're on a college campus, drugs like Ritalin or Adderall or Concerta, which are used and abused by a lot of different people. And once we get to this kind of concept of freedom of thought, it's how much does it include for what you can do from a self-directed perspective to change your thought, to change your brain, and to access your brain. And those are kind of, I think, interesting conversations. But maybe we'll start by showing them this, is that? Yeah, that's the, the experimental part of the lecture yeah, is coming because up Because it's always fun to get to put a device on somebody's head <laughs> yeah. who is up here. You, you so notice I'm, the neuroscientist has nothing to do with this experiment. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, he's uh, about to uh, give us some reactions to it. All right, so here we go. So the visual going to work? Or? We have no visuals, right? We have no visual, but we're going to have sound, which is, I think, All right. okay. All right, so what Why do I feel like I'm in Back to the Future all of a sudden? Do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I love Back to the Future. Yeah. Okay, so what I have um, Tim hooked up to here that's fun is, um, and I'll take this, is a, uh, it's a consumer-based, and you can see a pretty crude-looking EEG device, which means that it's going to pick up really basic 
brainwave activity, and it has a single electrode. If you are familiar with EEG, you'll have seen pictures of a cap that has a ton of different electrodes. That's the medical grade you know, or research grade kind of thing that is out there, which is gonna give you a lot more information than this is going to give you. But there are devices now like this one. This one is developed by a company called NeuroSky that um, you can wear. And you can wear, and this is a little application called Cortex. And what you're hearing right now is Tim amazingly being able to meditate in front of all of us. Well, I'll, I'll get one. Yeah, so we'll, we'll let him do that. Okay. We'll be quiet. If you can see from the back, um, the bars here, you can at least hear the birds chirping. The more, the louder the birds chirp, the better he's able to get his brain wave frequency within a precise band that this computer program, this app, defines as meditation. Okay, and so when it's your alpha waves are in a particular wavelength, that that correlates with meditation. Similarly, there are other we'll turn programs. Back for a while. So I'm okay. not doing it now, but I'll do it. Okay, so, so right now watch. I'm not, just like chatting, whatever. So now he's chatting, now he's gonna meditate, and it turns out he's pretty good at meditating. Pretty cool, right? So pretty neat because this tells us literally in real time his brain activity. We are reading in a very crude way his brain, right? Um, and it's very crude in the sense that like, I'm not reading his mind, I'm not reading his thoughts, I'm not seeing the visual imagery in his brain, but I do know, at least for the area in which we're measuring, whether or not his brain is within this particular, whether or not he's emitting this particular wavelength of activity. Um, and there are applications that measure a lot of other things as well besides that. Um, and these are devices that are now on the market. And we can measure whether or not you're drowsy. We can measure whether or not you are about to go into um, insulin shock or about to have an epileptic seizure. Um, and uh, there are, there's a lot of interest in these, whether it's for individuals who just want to have fun with it, individuals who want to have neurofeedback to improve their concentration. Um, there's some studies that suggest this might be better, like Ritalin and Concerta. If you do 20 hours with one of these devices, you train your brain better than taking drugs. But insurance companies are really interested and have piloted some studies to see whether or not they could require or incentivize truck drivers to wear these devices while they're whether or not they're drowsy, which is the leading cause of accidents in this country. Um, or medical companies are interested in figuring out whether or not they could have people who have epilepsy wear it so that they could find out beforehand that they're about to go into epileptic shock and then be able to take preventive measures or about to go into insulin shock and take preventive measures. This is all to say there's a lot of cool stuff that's happening, but can a company require that you wear this while you're in the workplace to figure out whether or not you are paying attention and being productive? Um, there are companies already who are piloting this to figure out whether or not they could require and increase productivity in the workplace by requiring people to do this. Do you have any freedom of your thought processes that would prevent a company, a government, an individual from requiring you to wear this information and from them accessing what's happening in your brain. Again, this is the crude level. There are some scientific studies out there which suggest we can get to a much more precise level of decoding the visual imagery in your brain or um, even some more complex thoughts you're having or even your ATM password that you're thinking of. But that research is much more controversial as right. well, um, you'll tell us. Yeah, and so. Um if the law students in the audience will notice we've moved from sort of a First Amendment discussion to a Fourth Amendment discussion or to a sense of do you have some, is part of freedom of thought some privacy, some protection of what you're thinking? Is that part of what we mean by having freedom of thought of not uh, allowing uh, people to know what mental state you're in, say, for example? But I, I wanted to, you know, first of all, explore whether the, the, the plaus technical plausibility of, of this thing is really worth worrying about. And I think that's something, Michael, you had some skepticism about. Sure. I mean, the, the demo is fine. I mean, I have no skepticism about that. It, basically, the demo is you close your eyes and you're effectively meditating and you open them and you're not. 
but the for I, I I'm not too worried. I mean, if this is that's not, not fair. So I will say I close my eyes and I am unable to get meditation in the way that Tim is able to get meditation, where he's practiced much more because it is different. Closing your eyes doesn't get you into a calm, reflective state that actually matches that particular brain wave. I can still have racing thoughts and be unable to actually get to that brain state. Fair so enough. It's a little the, different. the years I spent in the monastery helped. With it, it's relatively simple though. So the 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 question really is, I mean, of course, none of us can predict the future, but since what I do for a living is study thought processes at a pretty refined level, the level of single cells and brains, things like that, um, the idea that the, um, the cruder technologies, EEG, even with the ton of electrodes that Nita mentioned, or um, functional imaging even, which is uh, you know, extremely important and useful tool for understanding how the human brain works in particular, um, it's still, it's not the resolution one needs to understand um, the thought processes, let alone the content of the thought. Um, as a matter of fact, I think m neuroscientists don't, don't even understand what a content, we do not understand what a content of a thought even looks like in the brain. We understand some things about the processes leading to things like decisions, and you know, we're very proud of that. But actually, what is a content of a thought? The level of the cells in the brain is an open uh, avenue of investigation. But anyone's bet is that the level of resolution required to read a brain, really read a brain, and not do sort of smoke and mirrors magic shows, um, um, you know, choosing among N items or something, um, you know, do you see a happy or sad movie or something like that, um, that to, to really achieve the thing that would maybe have us concerned when we worry about um, our freedom and our privacy in particular, um, I think that that's just the stuff of science fiction right now, and to some extent, the, st the stuff of hype. Of so, so I agree and disagree. Um, I agree that we are nowhere close to being able to do things that people are really worried about. And uh, I don't know if you ever saw that Mel Gibson movie where it's like what women want, I think was the name of it, where he could actually, he like, a hairdryer fell in the bathtub and all of a sudden he could hear only what women were thinking. Uh, and Helen Hunt was in this movie. Did anybody see this movie? It was a great movie. But anyway, um, I don't think we're at that level yet where we can actually hear what other people are thinking or even necessarily in real time be able to reconstruct the visual images in their brain. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't worry because, um, for example, suppose I was required to wear one of these devices and you could start to see cognitive decline over time. Should you worry about that? Uh, about whether or not there's some likelihood of health insurance companies being able to do things like discriminate against you or life insurance companies or, or disability uh, companies, disability insurance companies, or in the educational setting, uh, particularly here in New York where there's, you know, at the earlier stages trying to get into schools for kids, whether or not kids would be discriminated against. I mean, there's a lot of ways in which simple decoding of what's happening in the brain impacts, I think, our conceptions of privacy and freedom of thought, even if we never get to the point of being able to decode at the granular level exactly what any person in this audience is thinking at any given time. So let me ask you a question back, not, not being a lawyer, but the, is there a difference, a qualitative difference in your mind between um, the kind of invasion of privacy at the level of um, brain reading technology versus, say, um, having access to a child's test scores? Yes. Um, and the difference to me is somewhat the difference between speech versus thought. I worry a lot more about protecting thought than I do protecting speech. When I choose to speak, I choose and again, this goes back to a lot of the conversation we are having earlier, choosing, right? I choose to share information with the world. Um, whereas, and if I take a test, and maybe I'm compelled to take a test, but you know, it, I, I've actually given a manifestation of my behavior, of my thought pattern, of my cognitive abilities in a test that I've chosen to engage in. And I think that's different than information that I have not yet chosen to share with the world. Um, and when you can start getting at information I've not yet chosen to share with the world, I think the chilling effect on robust thought, on engaging with society more generally is much worse than even on getting at speech. And so I think freedom of thought to me is far more fundamental of a liberty interest in society that is worth fretting about, protecting, and discussing than even speech. It is kind of 
what I like to say is the last bastion of freedom that we it's have. It's sort of what you've just described is what a, a lawyer would call a prior restraint, difference between a prior restraint and a, and a I'm sorry to, to put, you know, the, the prior restraint in English common law is the, the punishment of speech before it happens versus the, the later punishment of speech. And that's what you're saying is the difference between thought and uh, test results. Although to some extent, um, a lot of it depends on the granularity. Don't you I think? Mean, so, I mean, because so, like so if you you're saying, so you should be more yeah. worried when it is more granular, and and we disagree a little bit here. I I, I not being a, a scientist and liking some of the work that some of the scientists are doing that um, is smoke and mirrors. Uh, I I think there's some really interesting work that are being done by scientists who are both computer scientists and neuroscientists at the same time, where what they're doing is creating algorithms to try to map information while people are, for example, watching movies or while they're um, hearing stories and trying to come up with uh, kind of a brain dictionary to be able to decode uh, what different brain activation patterns mean in the brain. And uh, I think that work is really interesting and, and potentially really promising. I think you're right that we'll never get to the d degree of granularity with the tools that we have today, but I don't discount the possibility that we could develop tools that would enable us to be able to get to the level of granu granularity that's necessary. But um, I would worry more at that point when we have that degree of granularity, and I would think truly there is, now we're in the total transparency world and I fear much more about freedom of thought. But that doesn't mean I'm not worried and don't think that there are a lot of implications for freedom of thought that can happen already today with this that was communicating to my phone via Bluetooth technology that's utterly unsecure. Uh, that any decent hacker could hack into. Well, I wouldn't mind knowing if my students were asleep, but I guess I can tell by looking at them. Um, <laughs> uh, just one last, this is maybe a funny question, but you know, since you have access to technologies uh, much more sophisticated than this, if there were no ethical restraints, and I realize there are, could we know with some, what could we know, uh, what could we know at uh, the maximum granularity available with the technologies you have today? And I realize that would involve opening up human skulls, like and that would be, Unpleasant, but would we? Do you think we, with those kind of tools, would know any anything of granular interest? Uh, not really, um, uh -huh. because I mean, what you you would know some simple things like what's represented in the visual cortex, for example, right. when you look around, but you wouldn't know what you were seeing. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you have seen these demonstrations of you know you're watching a bunch of ball players passing balls and you don't see a gorilla walking among them. There's lots of things in your field of view right now. If you closed your eyes and I suddenly asked you a question about various things in the room, you'd have no idea. But they, we could read those things out from your visual cortex. We wouldn't know that you actually saw them. Similarly, um, your brain is constantly engaged in preparing possible actions, questions in your mind, things like that you're not aware of. It hasn't pierced consciousness yet. Uh, so we could read a lot of things out. Actually, we'd, I think we'd, there'd be a dearth of, of, of information that would actually be irrelevant to actually your actual state of, of understanding of the world, your perception, your plans of action. So what but, we but read... Wait, but so that's, I mean, you, you've said two things that are, I, I mean, you've discounted something that I think is really interesting. What you've said is we could probably be able to see what's in their visual field, but not be able to tell whether or not they've consciously processed it, right? And, and to you, that's uninteresting that we can see what's in their visual field but not get at their conscious process. And to me, I think that's really frightening that we could actually get to the point... You already know what's in their visual field. You can just take a picture of it. But not if I... I mean, not unless I actually have the ability to sit there and take the picture of it, right? If I want to actually um, scan what everybody is seeing or if I want to know what an eyewitness saw at a crime scene, for example, um, could I do that? Could I look at all of the different visual cortexes and, no. and be able to... Why not? Because what you'd know is what's in the world that you could take a picture of with your camera. I mean, you have to know something about the optics of the eye and, you know, what the, what the granularity is of vision in the cortex. But leaving aside the details, you, would, you could know as much about what you'd get, you'd actually know more about what the person actually saw that, not saw, not the psychological sense of seeing, but just what they processed from the eye into the brain by taking a picture of the world, okay? And assuming you can watch what the, where, have a rough sense of where their eyes are, which doesn't require an invasion of privacy. I can see where, those of you in the front row, I can see what you're looking at from moment to moment already um, without you thinking about it and, um, and without any technology. Nonetheless, so I know, I know what's impinging on your visual cortex. Fine. I don't know what you see, though. And I don't know what the eyewitness saw or what the eyewitness might have falsely remembered seeing. We can't tell that. That's because that's, that's at a level of, 
of processing that the deep point is, that's at a level of processing that is not about representation of information in the brain. It's at a level, back to the early part of the conversation, of interrogation with a purpose to work out a kind of an idea about what might have happened, okay? So a vision is itself an interrogation problem. It's not actually a processing problem. This, to me, this is a criticism of much of neuroscience that's invested in representation, as much as it is a criticism of thinking that you're going to read out what is seen in the brain by taking a picture of the activity of the brain at that moment. I think, just think, that, I think that's misguided even, that's a separate issue even from the granularity and the technology. But just, I mean, you're right in catching me in my contradiction, Nita. The, the, there, I, I'm contradicting myself in terms of saying that if you had a million electrodes and in a science fiction world could put them all in a, in, in a brain and didn't worry about the ethics of doing so and didn't worry about the burning up of the brain for the energy that it would require to actually shine light in the brain to read things out. I'm I mean, not recommending these things. Yeah, <laughs> I mean the point is that these, are, these aren't just speculations. I mean we worry in neuroscience right now thanks to the Obama Brain Initiative about recording from lots and lots of neurons at once but someone has to calculate how much actual energy transfer will there have to be into a brain to record a thousand neurons. We have billions of neurons, right? But to, you know, to you know, to, to record even a thousand neurons, and we, we worry that you know we'll do more harm to tissue than um, than good. So these are these are sort of technical issues that limit our ability to read out information from the brain. Well, why don't we start? Unless you, I wouldn't mind getting. What you want. Let me let me just say one thing, which is yeah. um, uh -huh. for a separate conversation. There were so many rich, interesting things that you said in what you just said, right? Which is the concept of seeing as a conscious experience, as opposed to. Um, the brain uh, and, and processing visual cues. I mean, that's a deep kind of philosophical question about what does it mean to see? What does it mean to think? Um, and I think as we get to these questions of freedom of thought, it might be that we don't care that much about what the brain sees but what the conscious thinking self doesn't see. Or it might mean that we actually do care what our brain sees because that's all part of the internal workings of ourselves that we haven't traditionally had be transparent to the world. Um, right. and, and I think it's kind of a rich and interesting conversation to be had about what those words really mean and what they mean to us in a society where transparency becomes a possibility. I think we might have time for one audience question if anyone uh, has a question they'd like to ask. Why don't you go ahead? And I think you should better go to the microphone, unless you can you know, use brain transmissions yeah. some way. <laughs> um, I'm interested in this idea of you were talking about the government enabling people to make good decisions, but what about this idea of the government enabling people to make bad decisions? I'm thinking specifically there's this, uh, there's a this American Life episode about um, modern day terrorism charges and basically um, it, it follows a case where you have these people and they had thoughts of anarchy which you said are not unlawful. Right. Um, and then it kind of follows how these thoughts transition into actual actions through a sting operation. Um, in, and then, of course, these people are arrested. Um, and so I, I guess I'm interested in the medical side in terms of enabling. Um, where do enablers factor into decision-making process? And then also the legal and ethical side of taking, kind of transferring someone's thoughts into actions which you can prosecute. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, I mean, it, it's it, w your description. I haven't seen that episode, but it, it, it sort of reminds me of the um, Tom Cruise movie Minority Report, where, uh, you know, there was this kind of difference between thought versus action, um, and could you prosecute thought versus action? Um, and then the separate question of a lot of times, if we look at much crime in this country, uh, society has enabled it, whether it's through poverty questions or drug addiction, um, early intervention programs that could have prevented crime from happening by preventing childhood abuse from actually happening, um, and trying to figure out where does responsibility lie? Do we put the responsibility at uh, the individual who made the final action choice, that is pulling the trigger of the gun, or do we hold all of the societal actors responsible, whether it's the parents or um, the failings of government or the failings of the you know, direct socio, uh, socio-cultural factors that led to that question? That's a really rich, interesting conversation to be had. For now, the law has um, 
ended up with the last decision maker, which is the criminal, and said that uh, as long as you had freedom at that last moment to make an action choice otherwise, which was to not pull the trigger of the gun, um, no matter what all of the precursors were that led you up to making that choice and all the contributors were, you were the last best chooser um, who we could deter. And so we put responsibility at your foot because you were the easiest one to be able to ultimately deter and change the behavior for. But that doesn't mean that we necessarily have gotten that right since there are appropriately many different actors who are responsible for the ultimate criminal actions that occur. Yes, you have broached the question of responsibility, which is a enormous topic. And since we run out of, <laughs> which is a great topic, but one uh, which we fortunately will have to end things, unless you wanted to say anything, Michael, about this. I, I would just say yeah. one thing, which is that, is that I think you've touched on, you, you've hit all the themes tonight. And, and, and the thinking about coercion or um, um, I forget the word you used for it, but I mean, limiting the number of possibilities, which is you know when people are lulled into maybe joining ISIS or or these the, I heard that episode, you know, doing things they probably really had no intention of doing with you know in, in entertaining terrorist possibilities. The um, that that the thinking about limiting possibilities, which is the way we started this conversation, and 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 establishing the set of possibilities is just is a, is a way to control people's thoughts. Now we. We're worried today about the freedom of our thoughts, but to some extent, we, uh, the control, controlling the possibilities is a way of uh, constraining our thoughts and constraining our, our freedom. I mean, it's, it's very rare for, to find a, an ethicist and a philosopher and a neuroscientist who can kind of completely agree on the fundamental issues of freedom, which we uh, agree on, and, and, um, and, and, and that, that a mind composed of a brain is nonetheless free to entertain possibility. And what we've spent the night talking about, interestingly, I don't know that we anticipated this, was, um, was really the focus has been on what the possibilities are, um, whether they're lack of possibilities for lack of art in a school, the example I gave, or the, the solitary confinement, or even the, um, in the case of the psychopath, the, the, um, the uh, poor ability to um, uh, empathize with another uh, being. So um, um, anyway, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic topic. We've had another hour. I'm sure we'd go at it like mad with it. Right. Well, why don't you jo join us in thanking our, our speakers for uh, the presentation tonight. Thank, and thank you so much for coming. And I believe we have a reception in the World Room, which is at the other end of this.